and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, um, Identity on a Mobile Device. And we're going to be looking at two uh, use cases today, the airport passenger experience and higher education identity uh, use cases. My name is Randy Vanderhoof, and I'm the Executive Director of the Secure Technology Alliance. I want to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, and it will be available for playback along with the presentation deck after the webinar has concluded. We'll provide you with an email with the link to where you can go and access this information. Also, there should be time at the end of the presentation for questions, and so we encourage listeners to submit their questions using the user dashboard that's on the GoToWebinar uh, screen that you have. Um, I'll return at the end of the presentations to lead the question and answer session. Um, and I do encourage you to, while the speakers are presenting, um, as they come to mind so that we have time to organize them in advance so we can get to as many of those questions as we have time for. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, let me introduce to you today's uh, presenters for this webinar. So um, I've already introduced myself and um, Tom Lockwood um, is the Senior Associate of Business Development at NextGen ID. And he's an experienced industry veteran in the federal state uh, government identity and security market. Tom also serves on our executive committee on the Secure Technology Alliance Board of Directors and also serves as the chairperson for the Alliance's Identity Council. Uh, joining Tom today, we have Chris Rundy. Uh, Chris is the Director of Airport Innovation Accelerator at the American Association of Airport Executives, um, which serves over 5,000 airport leaders across the U.S. and created the accelerator as a as a way to drive new solutions across the community. In addition to Chris, we have Mark Sarver, who is a, a chief behavioralist at uh, Biometric Signature ID, and he's responsible for research into the application and use of biometric solutions to eliminate fraud and improve user experience while protecting user privacy. If we can go to the next slide. We have some people who are joining today's webinar who may be joining us for the first time and may not be familiar with the Secure Technology Alliance. So for those of you who are new to this organization, we're a nonprofit multi-industry association and our work is to stimulate the understanding, adoption and widespread application of secure solutions. Um, this is a member-driven environment where we provide education and information about how smart cards, other embedded chip technologies, and related hardware and software can be adopted across all markets in the United States. If you look to the right side of the screen there, you see some of the market areas in which we focus on, such as access control, authentication, healthcare, identity management, Internet of Things, mobile payments, and transportation. And these are some of the areas where we're helping to stimulate the adoption and use of secure technologies to uh, protect uh, tr transactions and um, private information. Um, what our organization does to facilitate this is um, we bring stakeholders together, together to collaborate on promoting these uh, technologies and addressing the challenges. Uh, we publish information in the form of white papers, webinars like today, workshops, newsletters, position papers, and provide content on the internet, and create conferences and events that focus on specific markets and technology. We also provide other educational programs, including training and uh, industry certifications for uh, professional development. And our members utilize the networks created by participation in these working committees and uh, projects um, to help not only share ideas, but also gain knowledge from each other. And through um, these collaborations, uh, we are able to produce very strong industry communications um, through our public relations and web resources and social media outlets. So if we go to the next slide, um, within the Secure Technology Alliance, we address the needs of specific markets and particularly uh, particular security areas by forming industry councils. Um, 
the Identity Council is one of these, and it's the group that's sponsoring today's webinar series on the identity landscape. The mission of the Identity Council is to be a focal point on the Alliance's identity and identity-related efforts, leveraging embedded chip technology and privacy and security-enhancing software. And so um, its focus is to provide support for the various vertical markets where we um, provide thought leadership and education and awareness building, and also to lead the discussions around how identity is changing and what are some of the unique challenges and use cases for digital identities and how they affect the usage across these markets. If you look at the council resources that the Identity Council has either contributed or participated in, you'll see a mix of topics related to assurance levels, the federal government's use of identity and its FICAM uh, projects, and that was a joint uh, project with our uh, Physical Access Council, um, explanations about different forms of identifiers and authentication, um, and then uh, support for identity management in healthcare, um, use of smart cards and privacy and other, other topics here. Um, all of these resources are available on the public website, and so I would encourage you to visit and, and follow up with these resources in the future. If you go to the next slide, please. So to talk further about this series of projects um, being led by the Identity Council, I'd like to hand things off now to Tom Lockwood, the chair of the Identity Council. Tom? Hi, thank you, Randy. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking your time and committing it to us this afternoon. I think we have a very interesting agenda for you. I just wanna talk very briefly, um, next slide, with regard to where we're at in the identity space. Right now, how identity is trending is identity is moving from vertical markets where identity was associated with particular products like a passport or a PIV card or a CAC card or a driver's license or an employee access credential. And they're starting to really not only you know, move horizontally across markets, horizontally across verticals, but we're also looking at blending where we're looking at things like in-person, desktop, mobile, and machine-based identities. And they're getting more and more complementary. We're looking at a big expansion within the mobile market and the kiosk markets. So those are, if you would, the delivery across, within the verticals, across the verticals. Privacy continues to expand. Identity proofing with the changes now that's occurred with NIST, it allows us to use technology to begin to add additional convenience, reduction in cost, but really leveraging the strength of mobile devices and machines. We're looking at automation of the back end and machine learning. As we look through with regard to the biometrics, one of the, one of the groups we're teaming with today is IBIA. So in Mark's presentation, again, this is a partnership between the Alliance and, and IBIA. When we look at distributed ledger technology, again, more capability, the blurring between physical and digital security, physical identity documents now becoming more and more augmented with digital capabilities. Again, we've talked about authentication and partnering with FIDO and some of the other, if you would, authentication strategies, zero trust models, and again, modularization of identity services. Identity, again, people want to mix and match and pay for what they see value in. So again, the immediate piece we wanted to look at is mobile devices, identity and mobile devices, and really do a broad assessment to understand what's occurring in the market space. Again, today is the fourth of a series of webinars. So within the strategy, what we wanted to understand is across the mobile space, within the verticals, within healthcare, within banking, within transportation, you know, where are different communities focusing identity and mobile devices? When we start seeing where people are applying improved trusted identities onto mobile devices. So our strategy really has been, how do we get a broad assessment? How do we start beginning to look at best practices where there's areas of convergence, if there's strong areas of disagreement or conflict, how do we start considering those so we do a much more consistent design build strategy, how we add to convenience of users. So again, our target audience is our members and our members' customers. And again, what we hope as we come through this that we'll see opportunities for us as a community to further develop and expand the market space. 
So our approach has been very broad. We've teamed with different groups. So we've teamed with AMVA. We've teamed back over with the with the federal um, interagencies. We teamed with AAAE, IBIA, and others. And again, our point is that we are part of an integrated community and how we cut across these, how we come up with our best practices and our strategy to do that is reflected here in this in this effort that we're briefing through. We see a phase set of deliverables as we come through and this webinar is one of them. If we can go to the next slide, please. So in these webinars, what we hope to do is raise general awareness. You'll see in webinar number one, we started off with in-person proofed identities, again, teamed with the federal government of where they're looking at derived credentials, teaming back over with AMBA as they're looking at mobile derived or mobile driver's licenses. And again, that's the process of putting a trusted identity on a device. The next piece in teaming with the Access Council and all the companies that are part of the Access Council, how do we consume that identity in physical and logical applications? Webinar three, we looked at three different sector implementations. Now today, what we're looking at is identity and mobile devices and enabling. And again, we have really two very interesting pieces for you to be aware of. And lastly, for webinar three, we'll talk about commonality and integration, commonality to the handsets and then backend integration. So with this, I'd like to pass over to Chris Rundy. Chris is representing AAAE. And Chris, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Tom. Um, so my role as the director of the Airport Innovation Accelerator is to work across the airport community with our members, which are typically, in my case, the chief technology officers, chief innovation officers, uh, CEOs, COOs of largest airports across the U.S. and spans all the way through the community. Uh, and we end up identifying what their common needs are and taking that to the innovation community. Um, we, as part of that, we spend a lot of time with our government partners at DHS and FAA to identify their challenges as well. Uh, the goal of which is to arrive at solutions that really benefit the entire industry. So if we go into the next slide, it goes uh, on three points that we're gonna cover in the agenda. The first of which is, is talking about airports and the seamless passenger journey, which is arguably the hottest topic in the industry right now. And then we will dive specifically into the use case for customs and border protection. You're already seeing this at some airports um, where you have uh, biometric gates for people exiting the country. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how that is moving forward uh, in the next steps and momentum at the last part. Um, so on the next slide, we talk a little bit about uh, AAAE for background. It's a, uh, the American Association of Airport Executives has been around since 1928, and it serves over 5,000 airport members representing 80 some, uh, 800 some airports. Um, we do a lot of the typical uh, association stuff in terms of uh, working with our government partners and talking with folks on Capitol Hill, but we also hold a significant number of events and we're known for delivering services that really benefit the entire industry and helping airports achieve their missions uh, through economies of scale. Um, so if we go to the next slide, just taking a broader look at the aviation community in the U.S., um, we see 750 million passengers a year coming through our airports and the economic impact to the U.S. alone is, is in the range of 1.6 trillion dollars which is about five percent of the U.S. GDP but I think what is even more impressive is the reach. I, I would suspect that anybody participating in this webinar has been on an airplane and has experienced the passenger journey. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, it gives you uh, a visual representation of how airports are looking at the end-to-end -end experience. Uh, historically, I think the airport experience has been, okay, you get to my curb, I'll get you to your gate, and we'll, we'll be done with it. Um, as you'll see in, in this slide, we're really trying to take it from dreaming to destination. The idea that uh, as you're booking your flight and your travel, uh, there's an integration and the seamless component to your travel that takes you on the green path uh, where you're planning and you're getting ready all the way to the yellow path where you are arriving at the airport, either in an Uber or parking, going through security, uh, arriving at your gate. Then you get to the blue part, which is more in, uh, in the air experience, and that is where we lean on our, our airline partners. 
Uh, and then when you arrive, where you're picking up uh, on the red part at the top, where you're picking up your bag, going through customs if you're international, and getting to where you want to be. And the main point here is there are lots of touch points in the airport passenger journey, and it's something that we're dedicated to finding out. So at this point, we are going to open up uh, a poll for the audience to get an idea of where you'd be willing to use your mobile identity in this seamless passenger journey. Um, so you should see the quick poll came up, come up. I just saw it myself. And you can pick, select one or more of the following. Uh, mine is paused right now. Oh, it's for attendees only. Well, there you go, that explained it. <laughs> um, Randy, Kathy, you guys can, uh, me when it's time for us to go back and then I can we can take a look at those poll results and then transition to the next slide. So see the poll question and there's the poll results. So it looks like uh, the travel booking, the security checkpoints and boarding all really come in high among travelers and that actually is very consistent with what we're seeing across the ecosystem. Um, but frankly, there's nothing under uh, 40%. So what we're observing is a willingness among passengers to engage and share information in order to get benefits. Um, but in order to do that, you have to tie out the ecosystem together. So that's where I would transition to the next slide that just gives a sample of the moving pieces that airports have to maneuver through on a regular basis. Uh, this a specific example is around maps. So airports historically have had maps for planning purposes, and uh, over the last uh, few decades, it's, it's matured into maps that go onto websites, and now they are fully interactive maps uh, that you can access through your mobile device. Um, and the demand now is to make that interactive map connected to all of the various players in the ecosystem, from the airlines to the concessionaires to your Uber and Lyft rides. Um, and, and the importance of this slide is to recognize the complexity that airports have in managing the, the ecosystem. Um, and we can accentuate that further by going to the next slide and acknowledging a recent passenger survey globally from our partners at IATA that polled over 2,000 travelers to really get a sense of what their priorities are now and what they're looking for going into the future. So the next slide talks uh, about the customer journey that we took, looked at earlier and identifies where satisfaction is high uh, and where it is lacking. Uh, when that comes up, you'll see that uh, there's steady progress uh, in the booking and the payment, as well as the check-in areas, so the early parts of the progress process, uh, but areas where it is lacking is in the security, the border control, um, and other onboarding services, and I don't think that would be a surprise to most of the attendees on this webinar. Uh, but what we'd like to do is go into a little bit more detail. On the next slide, it was interesting to note that privacy is uh, something that is still very important, but as I mentioned, I think as the value to the passenger journey increases, people are willing to give up their data, but they're not willing to sacrifice their privacy as part of it. I think data breaches have contributed to this metric, um, but the net takeaway we have from this particular one is that privacy is gonna to continue to be a critical component. However, um, more and more passengers are willing to give up data if that privacy is secured. Um, and that's where we go to the next slide that talks about the paperless experience and the idea that travelers will choose biometric identification as a replacement of their passports, as an example, more often than not. That number was uh, up significantly from the last year. Um, and I think at this point, uh, U.S. mobile passport has uh, millions of downloads and is uh, cited as one of uh, the major success stories with our partners at Customs and Border Protection. Um, as we go to the next slide, we're talking about the seamless passenger journey a little bit further. There's a desire to connect these pieces uh, of the process uh, at one time. So at your booking, for instance, the idea of having your hotel insurance, transportation, car, 
uh, is just the tip of the iceberg. I, we are also seeing demands or desires to reserve your parking spaces, um, to potentially um, order food to be delivered to your gate. Uh, but the idea being that your mobile device is going to unlock lots of different uh, amenities. Uh, and there's a growing expectation that airports will be able to provide and orchestrate that. Uh, and the key to promote of that, going to the next slide, is the interplay of data. What is going on during my journey? What type of information is important to me? Uh, consistently, flight status is, is the highest, uh, but we're seeing more and more demand for wait times and security and security checkpoints. Um, and uh, even personalized just uh, walk time, so that's the, the information regarding time, distance to gate. The, the one big thing that Seattle Tacoma International Airport is pushing, as an example, is a personalized travel time. So by the time, from the time you park your car to the time you get to your gate, they can give you a projection within a minute uh, based on the security checkpoint times that they're monitoring, the average walk time, and the congestion at various points inside the airport that they're monitoring. So the idea is that your mobile device will be rich with information and hopefully uh, you're more relaxed and willing to spend money at the airport, which ends up being a key driver for the airport. Um, and in the next slide, it really talks about the importance of apps and the emergence of the smartphone as uh, really a critical component of the air travel experience. Um, I'm not gonna elaborate on that because I think that's something we're experiencing right now. Um, so we can transition to the next slide, which really talks about one specific group, uh, millennials and things that they are expecting. Um, one is speed. Uh, they're, they're not, they want to have less than five minutes to wait for their bags once they get to their destination. They're looking for biometrics to replace passports, but also to be enabling different transactions along the journey. Uh, they're done with printing out boarding passes. They're, if they have to go see somebody, that something must have gone wrong. Um, so it, from an airport's perspective, we have to accommodate for these changes in expectations while still accommodating for those folks that do like the one-on-one -on -one engagement. But more and more, we're seeing people move to their start smartphones for the seamless passenger journey. Um, and with that noted, we're going to transition to the next slide, which really dives into where Customs and Borders Protection is going with their vision of a seamless travel, uh, where you no longer need travel documents. Uh, it re reduces the stress. There's transparency and awareness throughout the process. Um, and, and overall, CBP wants to simplify their operations while improving the passenger experience. Um, on the next slide, it talks about one of the core components of CBP's vision, which is facial matching. And they've orchestrated a system called uh, the Traveler Verification System, TVS, which allows airlines to ping Customs and Border Protection via the kiosk. This is the uh, deployment that you, uh, I mentioned earlier about biometric exit. Uh, this TBS system is available and airports are investing in biometric solutions that allow you to board without pulling out your passport. And it just matches against uh, the information that CBP has on file. And you get a red or a green or, or a yellow uh, depending on if the match is successful or not. Uh, and when we go to the next slide, it talks more about what CBP's transformations are intended here. So what are they trying to do? Um, they they want to get away from looking at the passport as a way for a border agent to make sure that the person in front of them is in fact the same person that was on the boarding mask. They're going to let the technology do that so they can focus on behavioral nuances. Is this person fidgety? Is there, is there other things that we should be looking for? Um, it eliminates the manual process, which actually is a pretty big uh, component of the processing time. So by eliminating that, it gets people through faster, or again, it allows the agent to dig a little bit deeper on the things that are important to CVP. Um, and then as, as you take this further into a real world example, the next slide talks about some of the results they're seeing in the exit process. Um, much faster clearance times. Um, getting hundreds of people on an A380 within under 20 minutes. Um, and what we're seeing now is sort of a race among airlines 
to deploy these technologies is becoming a customer experience imperative. And then for CBP, it's a driver uh, that improves their operation. So we're seeing a win-win um, and airports are sort of key to this because they're looking at airports to make the investment in the biometric technology to make it possible. Um, on the next slide, it talks about that CBP vision translating to the domestic part. So going to the checkpoints, the TSA checkpoints. Um, CBP has very openly been collaborating with TSA recently. They uh, almost always go on stage together at major events. Uh, and they've recently released, TSA that is, their biometric strategy, which says we uh, are going to fully leverage CBP's investment in biometrics and transition that to the checkpoint. Uh, so we're already seeing that. There's a uh, project deployed uh, in Atlanta recently, uh, as well as a pilot in LA. Uh, and we're expecting more and more of that to happen across airports. Um, but one of the other exciting things on the next slide is where CBP is looking at in future innovations. And it's really talking about smart queuing as an example where, um, yeah, we're on the slide after this, Kathy. Um, smart queuing is, you know, the idea that when you get off your plane as an international inbound passenger, we can tell you exactly where to go. You wouldn't believe some of the confusion that happens coming off of an international flight. Uh, but they're also looking at the, uh, the ways to further streamline the trusted traveler program, extending it, as we pointed out earlier, to uh, to different points in the passenger journey. And a key component on the very right side is data sharing. There's an openness for data sharing that frankly hasn't existed uh, in the past. Uh, the conversations are very rich right now. Uh, all of that being said, there is a strong bent towards maintaining privacy. The government has very high standards uh, and there are specific restrictions on what they can and can't do. But uh, as we transition to the next slide, it sort of ties it up what we as airports are focused on is the seamless passenger journey. There are key components of the journey that only the airport can enable from your parking to what you buy, what food you get, um, and, and all of your flight information while you're a uh, customer of the airport. Uh, so there's a move towards that and the mobile identity ends up being the linchpin for that. So this conversation that STA is driving is very pertinent to us. Um, and it's something that the accelerator, my group, uh, is dedicating a lot of energy into both for thought leadership conversations, but also for conducting pilots. So in 2019, we're going to see a lot of activity. Um, so with that, that concludes the aviation component. And I'd like to go to the next slide and transition over to Mark Sarver to talk about higher education. Thank you, Chris. Um, just as a bit of background, biometric signature ID is a gesture-based biometric password replacement. That's, that's sort of a mouthful. Um, the user actually draws their password instead of typing it. Uh, we provide identity and access management as a service to about 150 colleges and universities, as well as other industries, but today's focus will be on higher education level two remote proofing. Um, it should be noted as we discuss the implementation in the higher education market, it really does cross into virtually any market where remote proofing is needed, and I encourage you to think about the application in your particular industry. So um, let's get started. The, um, I would like to start by describing a few key factors impacting higher education. Uh, first of that is expanding online enrollments. The, uh, the traditional stereotype of the 18 to 22 year old full-time undergraduate student, student residing on campus right now represents only about 16 percent of the higher ed population in the united states so this has created additional need for authenticating those remote uh, learners and those remote students uh, more and more students are bringing their devices to campus and not so long ago educators were touting the mantra if every student had a computer in the classroom we could teach so much better. Well, it's happened and higher education wasn't prepared. 90% um, of students report having access to a mobile device and it's created issues for IT administrators and faculty. What we do know is that in higher education, mobile learning can increase learner satisfaction, retention, widen participation, and potentially reduce costs. Uh, mobile technologies can also enhance the student experience by connecting learners with advisors, and providing conduits for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. 
And one of the big drivers is accreditation. Uh, every college and university to have access to Title IV funds from uh, the federal government needs to be accredited. And those federal, federal regulations and regional accreditors are concerned about knowing who's taking an online course. Uh, the United States Federal Higher Education Opportunity Act requires that institutions offering distance education or correspondence programs have processes in place to ensure that the student registering for the course is the same student who participates in the course who receives course credit. Um, historically, it uh, identified three ways you could do that with login and passcodes, with proctored exams, or new technology. Well, knowing that logins and passwords are no longer safe and can be easily shared, proctored exams only account for a very small portion of the overall academic experience. Uh, the Southern Association of Colleges and Commissions uh, on College, which is a regional accreditor for those southern schools, remove those three options and put the onus back on the institution to say, you know, you have to prove to us as the accreditor that you know who is actually taking your class. Uh, financial aid fraud is a growing issue. The Office of Inspector General at the Department of Education recently published findings that 8.1% of financial aid is not dispersed to the correct person. And when you think in terms of how big financial aid is, that is an astonishing $7.72 billion of our tax money that is not going to the right, uh, right place. Uh, some of it is accidental, but there are large pale fraud rings with as many as 800 members that have been discovered. And probably one of the greatest uh, concerns that are facing higher ed right now, and a lot of them are just beginning to uh, to deal with it, is uh, the dark web and crypto mining. In March of 2017, the Digital Citizens Alliance uh, scanned the dark web and published the results where they found almost 14 million email addresses and the passwords belonging to faculty, staff, students, and alumni at higher education institutions. And students like many of us use the same password across multiple platforms. And cryptocurrencies are being created every day. From September 2017 till January of 2018, Vectra Cognito monitored the traffic and collected metadata from more than 4.5 million devices and workloads from customer cloud, data center, and enterprise environments. Of the crypto mining detections, 85% of those occurred in higher education. Let's transition to the next slide to discuss the proofing landscape. So we need to navigate this landscape to provide uh, mobile remote proofing solutions for our higher ed clients. Um, uh, those require, uh, some uh, institutions require additional levels uh, of remote proofing. It may be the type of program, uh, for example, high stakes like nursing. Um, others want to ensure that uh, at a high stakes test, maybe a final uh, midterm, that they can have additional levels uh, of proof, knowing that that is the correct student taking the course. As we looked at um, all of the email addresses that are out there, we know the vulnerability of the PIN and passwords, so uh, whatever solution we came up had to address that. Uh, the big drivers, it had to be used on multiple devices. Uh, that includes uh, mobile as well as desktop, and this uh, created a need for us to develop a web-based API and not just use a mobile app because it had to be accessible. So many students access their content, say, from a computer lab on a traditional desktop that uh, a mobile lab uh, certainly wouldn't work there. So on the next slide, let's discuss the solution. We added um, remote proofing as part of the gathering of the biometric password during the user's initial enrollment. But our clients were saying, yeah, but we want to be able to engage or, or reproofing uh, when it's needed, as we discussed earlier, maybe at a, at a final or a midterm. Uh, it must scale and be able to use in other markets and, and other industries as we were building it. And um, uh, we faced a make or buy scenario and ultimately opted to partner with MyTech, who was a pioneer in the online banking solutions. Uh, working with MyTech, we were able to, to take their mobile app for remote proofing and convert it to a web-based API allowing our users to remotely proof their identities across multiple devices, including desktop environments. And we call this, this product BioProof ID. And on the next slide, 
will actually watch the enrollment process for both BioSig gesture-based password along with the, uh, the BioProof remote proofing. During this video, you will see Chad. He's our chief technical officer enrolled in the system. Uh, the monitor in the center is what's happening on Chad's monitor. The small device in the bottom left corner is a camera focusing on Chad as he goes through the process. Enrolling in the BioSig system uh, requires the user to draw their password using a mouse, a stylus, or a touchpad, and Chad is using his touchpad. He will enter his unique password three times, building a biometric template. The system is capturing 14 biometrics, including speed, arch, angle, jitter, and length of his strokes. Uh, independent of testing has shown our system to have a false positive of 99.97 and a false negative of 99.78. Once Chad has successfully created his password, he will either scan the barcode displayed on the monitor with his mobile device or enter a mobile number to receive a, a link via text message, and Chad has chosen to enter his number. The top uh, left screen shows what Chad is seeing on his phone. By clicking on the link provided, it opens up a home screen to begin the remote proofing. I'll let, the, let it catch up. Uh, he then selects the, uh, the type of government issued document he will be using. In this case, he will be using his driver's license. It will then ask him to take a photo of the front of his driver's license and then the back of his driver's license. If the photos are blurry or cropped, it will not let him proceed. As you can see, the system is providing information as he proceeds through the process on both his phone and his monitor. In this step, um, the process is comparing the OCR printing on the front of the document with the scanned barcode on the back of the document. These must uh, match at this point or it will be rejected. Next, he'll be asked to take a selfie. The selfie is compared to the photo on the document. Depending on the internet speed of the devices, uh, the authentication can take uh, from a few seconds uh, up to a minute. Once it's completed, it will prompt Chad to enter his unique biometric password one more time. And this is then compared to the biometric template created earlier in the process. Um, as you can see, this was in real time. It took approximately two minutes to set up his biometric password and remotely uh, proof his identity. Um, let's take a look at some uh, actual use cases on the next slide. So we know financial aid fraud is a, is a big issue. So during the, uh, the financial aid process, uh, which may be the first time the student engages with the BioSig system, uh, the student information system would engage um, our system for the user to initially set up a biometric password. At this time, um, as we saw in the previous video, the user would also engage the remote proofing. So early on in the process, we know who is actually engaging with the system and who the students are. Uh, if you'll click one more time, Kathy, uh, in a more complex scenario, BioSig is used as part of a single sign-on system to enter the learning management system where various bits of content are gated and require BioSig uh, ID authentication before access is granted. Additionally, certain content can require BioProof uh, to provide step-up security and an on-demand remote proofing. So in this case, say it's a final exam, the student has been authenticating throughout the course using um, BioSig, but now when we get to this uh, bit of uh, particular content, we want to do an additional remote proofing. Let's uh, transition to the takeaway slide. So online education has changed the way students learn, how knowledge is transferred, um, and this provides many learners, particularly working adults, a new quality of life that otherwise would be unattainable. Um, it saves time and cost for you and your staff, um, and because the, the staff are not proofing an identity across a counter, it saves time and money. One of your uh, staff members are not looking at an idea to prove that uh, it is who they, they say they are. Um, plus, it provides an enhanced level of security. It's very difficult for humans to authenticate a government document, even with extensive training. If it were easy, underage college students would be in trouble with their fake IDs. Uh, electronic systems such as BioProof ID provide a level of authentication that simply is not possible as a human. Institutions can now streamline access to other applications and know that uh, the level of security is there across the campus community. 
um, especially for those remote users. And again, as we talked about it, um, the solution is a, a part of a tool set that can be used across multiple industries. I know we've talked about the specifics of remote level two proofing as it pertains to higher education, uh, but I challenge each of you participating to look at your industry and identify where remote proofing can provide a step up level of security while making the process easier for your users and save uh, staff time and resources. Thank you for your attention and I'll be turning the presentation over to Randy. Very good, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Mark and also thank you, Chris and Tom for your great uh, content on today's webinar. Um, we're gonna move into the beginning of the Q&A session now. Um, if you do have questions that you have not submitted yet, uh, you can do so now using the questions tab on the webinar dashboard on your screen. So um, while people are doing that, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, before we start the actual Q&A sessions, I just wanted to point out some uh, related identity uh, resources that are available from the Secure Technology Alliance that's available to the public. Um, the Secure Technology Alliance Knowledge Center has the resources listed here available to you and you should definitely check these out uh, in your spare time. So let's uh, advance to the last slide with the speaker contact information up while we begin the uh, Q&A session. Um, so the first question that uh, came in is for uh, Chris Rundy. Um, what are the key challenges holding back the seamless passenger journey? Yeah, I think the demand among passengers is very strong. Uh, I think the expectations are growing about what that seamless passenger journey looks like and, and the amount of information that you can access on your mobile device. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen is uh, the industry trying to tackle the whole seamless journey in one bite. Um, so what we're doing in terms of pilots is identifying key points in the process that can be built upon and we can build upon those successes going forward um, to build customer confidence and to uh, identify the areas that mean the most. So um, it's not for lack of demand, but I think to date it has been more conceptual. We're, we're transitioning now into a point where it's deploying the solution. Very good. Thank you. Um, next question uh, is for Mark. Um, biometric data is static in nature, so what is the security in securing while in motion and storage as well as processing? Yeah, great question. Um, so everything we do is encrypted, um, and what's really unique about the, the system is it's a gesture versus a physical biometric. Um, and so uh, the gestures are much harder to be compromised. Um, within our system because it's an API call and it makes uh, a call to our system, I don't need to know anything about the person authenticating themselves except the way they draw their password. That is then encrypted compared to our database and we simply return a one or a zero back to the system. So there's not a, a transfer of data in that way. Um, with the BioProof ID product, um, if, a, if a user doesn't want continue or ongoing authentication, say comparing a selfie to a selfie at some point, or um, then once we have uh, authenticated that, that uh, the OCR code matches the barcode, the selfie matches the, uh, the picture on the document, then that information is deleted. So we don't hold on to that unless that client specifically wants to be able to uh, to compare, say, a selfie to a selfie in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next question is uh, for you, Chris Rundy. Um, if the citizen does not have a government ID, how does the system proceed through the airport? Um, that is one of the foundational questions that TSA is grappling with now. Uh, the reason CVP is so successful is that you need a passport to cross borders. So they have an inventory of facial images that they're able to ping against. Uh, that's not the case for TSA. 
and it is arguably the biggest challenge. So when I mentioned the pilots, the only way these pilots are going is they're picking up people that have a passport and have already registered for an international flight. Um, so there's a few alternatives that are being explored. Um, the uh, maturity of Real ID and, and evolution of that uh, and AMPA's work is one where the driver's license could be um, a, a pillar. The other is uh, the registered traveler component, the idea that the clears of the world or, or others um, could broker a program that people could volunteer or opt into. And that would sort of unlock different stages of the passenger journey. So right now there's no clear answer. Um, I think there's still some questions around, should the government own it or should it be a uh, private sector initiative? Great, thank you, Chris. Um, next question is um, for Mark. Um, which LMS systems has Biosig integrated with? And you might want to explain what the LMS systems are. Sure. Um, you know, very seldom does higher ed create an acronym that the techie people don't understand. So um, LMS stands for Learning Management System. That's where the students engage with the content, uh, upload their assignments, uh, et cetera. Uh, we've engaged with all of the major LMSs in higher education, um, in addition to probably 50 others across corporate learning. Um, and because we are an API, it's a really easy integration. Um, uh, LMS systems have, uh, most are LTI compatible, which is learning tools interoperability, which allows you to have a much deeper integration. And so that, um, yeah, if you can think of all of the, the major players, the Blackboards, Canvas, uh, Brightspace, Moodle, uh, we've, we've integrated with, uh, with all of those players. Okay. And another question for you, Mark, does the BioProof ID product comply with NIST 863 for level two remote proofing? Yeah, great question. Um, it can be is the short answer. Um, and what we would need to do is validate uh, those those documents against uh, the issuing government agency. Um, at this point, um, higher ed is less concerned about validating against a, a government agency. So our clients define our uh, parameters um, and they haven't asked for this yet, but certainly the capabilities are there to make that validation against the issuing agency and Absolutely, this would comply with uh, NIST 863A for level two remote proofing. Okay. Uh, Chris, this next question is for you. Um, what is the business driver that makes the seamless journey in airports a reality? Uh, I think to date, the driver has been government efficiency and when we point to CBP, but the dynamic that's changing right now is the efficiencies airlines are getting from biometrics. So you'll see biometric bag drop and uh, biometric boarding that uh, is faster and more efficient, but for airlines, it means that they need less agents to process different points. Um, so it ends up affecting their bottom line, and that's why we're seeing a larger push for biometric and, and mobile identity uh, is right now from the airline side. Thank you. Um, Mark, this question uh, applies to you. Uh, for, for those who have not yet explored remote proofing, um, for their services, what's the biggest barrier to adoption? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, sometimes it can be cost um, because this is engaging, uh, you know, another system. Um, sometimes it's um, it really sometimes in the higher ed space, uh, institutions will want to use their um, student ID cards. Um, and we can make that happen, but it requires a uh, more expense on the back end than uh, just simply using um, uh, 
a government issued ID, it, it becomes a bit problematic where, um, let's say you have a high school student uh, that may not have a driver's license that's taking college courses. Um, and so then we work with those institutions to, uh, to make sure that uh, we can actually put in their student ID as a, a form of the authentication. Uh, the other thing is, I think it's a fairly new concept. Um, you know, a lot of institutions are still simply using username and password, and um, it really is part of uh, an education process, part of um, exposure to, to let institutions know that this next level of um, authentication is available. Thanks, Mark. I think um, following up on, on that, uh, can the biometric password be used as a standalone feature or does it need to be combined with the remote proofing aspect? Ah, great question. Um, yes, and uh, the remote proofing we typically see either at the initial onboarding or again um, at some predetermined big event. Uh, but the continuous authentication that using BioSig uh, throughout the, the course, throughout the engagement across the institution, uh, really eliminates passwords on campus and because uh, we all love passwords and it also provides really robust data to know who's engaging with which content where they are in the system um, so yes um, most of our institutions uh, use our products throughout the course and throughout the institution and then do that uh, level two proofing at the beginning or at some specified event Uh, next question is for Chris. Um, since you were uh, describing a, a, a vision of what you thought uh, this uh, experience would be like, um, how should um, industry products and services providers become more engaged with uh, your organization to participate in that vision? Uh, we have, uh, seamless travel, as I mentioned, is probably the most prominent innovation topic that our airports are interested in. Um, so the Accelerator uh, actually has a dedicated group looking at the seamless passenger experience, and we actually have a big event in Chicago that we host um, this year for the Innovation Forum. Um, so I think there are broad conversations that are, are in play right now, and I would encourage anybody that's interested in the seamless passenger journey to, to go to airportinnovation.org. Uh, it has information on the accelerator and a little bit on the seamless passenger journey, but um, it's sort of a starting point for engaging in multiple different areas of innovation in airports. Uh, next question is for Mark. Um, who measured or determined what the claimed false acceptance rate is on BioSig ID. Uh, yes, we were independently tested by the Tali Group, um, and so we had um, 9,488 hacking attempts uh, when people actually saw the password. Uh, so my password is 2323. So even seeing the password uh, of those 9,488 attempts, uh, none were able to uh, to successfully uh, mimic the password and gain access. Um, uh, obviously, the Tali group is not going to say we're 100%, so they use what's called the rule of three, which gives us the 99.97. Um, I will also add on our website, um, there is a hacking contest. Uh, we have uh, an actual password in our system. It's mom. If you are able to replicate uh, mom, we will send you $500. Um, we've had almost 20,000 attempts at that, and no one's been able to successfully uh, successfully win the money. Okay, so we have a lot more people who are going to challenge that uh, later <laughs> on today's call. So that's great. Um, I think we got time for one more question, and uh, I think this one will go to you, Chris. Um, um, how will the uh, DHS or TSA get access? to the photo database for all traveling citizens for face check at the airport? Um, so, you know, I, I think 
the model that exists right now is the one you're seeing with Clear, where they manage a lot of the biometrics, and it's a delegated responsibility. Uh, for those not familiar with TSA's process, they have a travel document checker at sort of the front of the line. They're the ones that look at your your driver's license and uh, you scan your, your boarding pass to make sure that you should be in the airport. Um, that is something that they're looking to automate, one. And two, uh, there's sort of a precedent for uh, offloading that or, or delegating the responsibility for that. So when it comes to DHS getting access to identity information and biometrics that they don't collect on their own, it typically comes in the form of a public-private partnership. Um, with that noted, they don't have a set framework for that. It ends up being one of the key questions they're trying to answer right now. Very good. Well, that's going to conclude uh, the question and answers and, and today's webinar. I want to especially thank uh, all of our participants today and those of you that submitted your, your questions. I want to particularly thank uh, Chris Rundy and Mark Sarver for their contributions to today's discussion. And uh, special thanks go out to Tom Lockwood um, and the Identity Council for helping uh, organize today's event. Um, the contact information is on your screen, so if any of you would like to follow up with our speakers individually, you can certainly do that. And certainly uh, you can contact me if you have any feedback or any suggestions uh, for future webinars uh, related to the identity landscape. Uh, again, today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for playback along with the presentation deck after the webinar has been concluded. Uh, you'll receive an email with a link where you can listen to the recording and download the presentation. Please feel free to share this information with uh, people within your own organization or others who cannot participate in today's webinar. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much and have a great day and a great holiday season.